Welcome to Dead Headspace. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and all other major platforms. I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough, with my co-host, Brennan LaFaro. Hello. And today we are joined by Max Booth III. Hello. Before we dive into this episode, I'd like to read uh, a new exciting upcoming expo run by Mary San Giovanni. Hey, readers, book reviewers, podcasters, librarians, booksellers, and lovers of great scary stories. Buzz Book Expo 2020 is just around the corner. Buzz Book Expo is a live streaming event in which publishers will be announcing all the great new horror fiction releases they have to offer this coming year. There will be interviews, Q&As, presentations, book cover reveals, and more from all your favorite horror publishers, all for free. Yes, free. Spend two days immersed in exciting book talk from publishers and authors alike. The event will take place from August 22nd to the 23rd. All information, including links to the expo, can be found at marysanji.wordpress.com slash buzzbookexpo2020. We hope to see you there. Max Booth III, thank you for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for inviting me on the program. My pleasure. Our pleasure. Uh, so we would love to know, what got you into horror? What got me into it? What, what was... Like what, a, what, what a picks off, you mean? What are you, what are you talking about? Like the genre itself or just like, ah, I'm afraid? <laughs> I suppose we could go in any direction with this. So uh, let's go with the genre. Okay, um, let me think, uh, I don't know, I mean, my, uh, when I was young, I had brothers who were older than I am, and, uh, I still do, they, they also aged as I aged, but when I was younger, that was true as well, and, uh, they were into the genre, and they just always had movies on, and I would watch them, and it just seems like something I've always been watching, and eventually reading as well. Okay, right on, man. Um, Brian, why don't you take over, and then I got uh, I got you right after. So, um, Max, you're originally from Indiana, correct? That is correct. So, tell us a little bit about how you wound up in Texas. Yeah, I uh, had a strange tra- the age of uh, 12 to 16. We all lived in a tiny hotel room. And we eventually got a house when I was 16, and uh, it wasn't great. Uh, my family has a issue with raid. I believe can be contagious if you were stuck in the same house with all of them. And uh, I saw what I saw the future that my brothers had because, well, as I mentioned, they are not the same age as I am. They are a bit older than I am. And I didn't want that same thing to happen to me. I didn't want to get stuck bumming money off of my mom every day to pay rent. I uh, didn't want to get cops called on me every night because of some fucking stupid thing going on with uh, alcoholism. And I thought the best uh, bet to avoid or prevent any of that from happening would be to hop on a bus and get away. And that's what I did. I uh, I wrote some Wikipedia articles for self-published authors at uh, 50 bucks a, uh, a pop. And I saved up enough to get a Greyhound ticket. And I went to Texas because I, I just knew a couple of folks who also lived in the state. And that seemed like an okay place to go. Now, San Antonio. You're in San Antonio, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a, a great music scene and kind of related art scene. Is that kind of what drew you there or part of what drew you there? Nope. <laughs> I, uh, knew, I knew nothing about it, and I still don't know much about it. I uh, do not go outside much. I am kind of in a small town between San Antonio and Austin, so I'm like on the edge of San Antonio. So I do most of my social traveling type of stuff up in Austin, and also in Austin, there's a great scene of creative types. Yeah, I think I meant Austin rather than San Antonio. I'm thinking that general area. San Antonio has some cool stuff. I just, I'm not hip to it. I don't know a lot of folks 
San Antonio. Hmm. So, um, as far as, you know, you, you kind of paid your way there by uh, freelancing a little bit. Is that kind of what got you into writing, or is that something you've always done? Uh, writing was something I did for a long time. I think I went to writing with the death of my dog at a young age, seven, maybe eight. Uh, she died. And I had a difficult time uh, dealing with that, and I came up with these uh, eventuals. The dog and I would go on, and it kind of just led from from that. But I always uh, have been in writing. I think the movie, uh, the film adaptation of Stephen King's Misery, got me interested in writing because it just seemed really cool that someone would <laughs> possibly uh, chain me to a bed. <laughs> I just kind of like that uh, being chained to a bed and being told, "Ah, you can't leave. You have to." type i'm like i wish that would happen to me now kind of like gerald's game yeah kind of i (laughs) I just like that that's (laughs) that's all i I like that that's your ultimate writing goal is i want to get famous enough that some you know uh off their rocker person is gonna come and they're gonna kidnap me chain me to a bed and break my feet with a goddamn hammer it's it's a hell of a goal yeah yeah (laughs) <laughs> the American dream. Well, well, if you read the book, if they uh, she chops the guy's feet off. Oh, that's right. That's right. It's uh, been a while since I, I got through the book, I'm afraid. Brennan, if you could be a character in a Stephen King book, who would you be and why, and would it lead you to being a writer? Good Lord. You had that really prepared. Um, if I could be a character in a Stephen King book, I would be... Son of a bitch, that's hard. Max, throw it to you. If you were a character in a Stephen King book, who would you be and why? Paul Sheldon filled the reasons <laughs> I just said. No, no you got to go wait, something I new here. Yeah. I would be, I would be Annie's pig <laughs> because I wouldn't have to live long and I could just relax and mud. I'm going with Pennywise. Why? I get to do whatever the fuck I want. I get to be whoever I want to be and live my life, be left alone, and, you know, just uh, have books written about me. A long book. A (laughs) brick book. There you go. Okay, I'll go with uh, Leland Gaunt from Needful Things. Just for that. I have a question. I have a question about it. Do you think Pennywise uh, witnessed the uh, whole uh, child gangbang in the school? And do you, how do you think he reacted to that? Do you think he was like, what the fuck is going on? With that? This is not me. I have nothing to do with this. Do not place this shit on me. I think that, that that could be the option, or he could have encouraged it back in the corner. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to connect any further dots. I'm not going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> is, this a, uh, is this podcast a uh, safe about gangbangs? It's safe for whoever the fuck you want it to be, Max. <laughs> Hell yeah. So what you'll say is this podcast is pro-child gangbang? <laughs> uh, Patrick, is that what you're saying? Huh. I'm stumped for once in my life. Well, no. No. It seems like an yeah. easy no. Yeah, no. <laughs> it, does. it does seem like an easy no. It also no. seems like you started the setup for that five minutes ago. <laughs> All right. So moving on. We have a question from one person, there is only one question, and it's by a Melvin Douglas Wallaby who asks, "Can you tell us about the?" <laughs> yeah, God damn it, fucking Brennan, you were right. I couldn't get through it. Can you tell us about the importance of marketing words and sections as inappropriate while editing an author's work? So I believe the person who actually asked you that question was uh, Michael David Wilson. He's and what good. he is referring to, yeah. <laughs> I'm a fucking investigator, man. Nothing gets past me. <laughs> so yeah, I, I do a lot of editing, obviously. I, uh, I run a uh, company called uh, Motion Machine Publishing. And we do books. I, those books uh, I edited... Michael's novella, The Girl in the Video. And whenever I edit something that he writes, I find it really amusing to uh, comment. Every time he references, like, alcohol, I just comment, this is inappropriate. <laughs> it is. 
So, yeah. yeah what you is he talking about alcohol that? in a book? No. Yeah. He's encouraging gangbangs. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm gonna shut the fuck up. Go ahead, Brennan. I have that book sitting on my shelf. I cannot confirm or deny what it does and does not endorse. Um, besides, um, I, I'm gonna phrase it as you know. I remember uh, hearing about finishing um, when when a certain video is playing. Finishing, yeah. however you want to yeah. take that. Like finishing. Would the video? you like me to uh, get into that? Yes. No, finishing a uh, an erection. Mm, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, Max, you're throwing me off tonight, man. God damn it. Okay, this is where we yell segue so, because there's a very... <laughs> there's there's a way to take in that query. <laughs> what you were uh, talking about is... Uh, so something we've talked about on podcasts in the past. Uh, ah, completely... Uh, one of the scenes in Michael's book involved a uh, the the protagonist watching this sex, sex video, and he gets uh, and, and the scene ended. But my genius uh, editing skills thought, hey, what if he also ejaculated at the end? And we had a long conversation about this, and uh, I won. So he uh, he went back and he added the ejaculation to the scene. And yeah, so if you go and read the book, spoil. A little uh, the protagonist uh, erupts at one point. That's what finishing means. I gotcha. Yeah. I did <laughs> listen to your episode on Ghoulish with uh, Michael. It was hard to drive a car listening to that episode due to how many times you made each other laugh. And as a result, I laughed a lot. So good job. Yeah. Thank you. Brennan, uh, uh, go ahead, man. My, my brain's just you, in la-la no, land right you're, now. You're, you are a fucking wreck tonight. Okay. So, uh, Max, you were talking a little bit about Perpetual Motion Machine. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got how that came to be. Yeah. I, uh, I began by at helping edit a magazine called Dark Moon Digest with my wife, Lloyd Michelle. We did not own the magazine. We just kind of helped out with it and... Uh, over long periods of different discussions, we kept going back to the idea of like, ah, what if we, what if we were in charge of all of this? Wouldn't that be something? And one night uh, we get drunk and uh, we had that discussion. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to begin a Facebook page. So I begin a Facebook page for a company, and we needed a name for it. At the time, a song by Modest Mouse called "A uh, Perpetual Motion Machine" was playing, and I went, "That's the name," and I made the Facebook page, and I invited all my friends to like it, and then the next day I, I realized what I had done, and I uh, couldn't back out then, so I was like, hey, I guess we have a publishing company now, and that was in 2012, and we have not deleted the page since. How's it evolved from that time to now? Well, we now own that magazine I talked about, so we uh, we bought out Dark Moon Digest from uh, the previous uh, owner, whose name was Stan Swanson. So now we magazine and we uh, we all in complete control of the magazine. We do conventions every year, except for the year twenty, for some reason. Not sure why. I can't uh, <laughs> not sure why at all. Uh, yeah, we we usually do a lot of local conventions. We uh, I mean, books have basically be all lives. It's what we do. It's what we talk about. It's what we bond over. It's, uh, everything we do is somehow involved with a book. I mean, even the podcasts we do is we do the, those podcasts to promote the books we do. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for um, your two podcasts, Ghoulish and Castle Rock, is Lori involved with the Castle Rock one? Yeah, she's the co-host. Because I, I apologize, I haven't listened to that one yet. I listen to Ghoulish though. Um, does she have anything to do with the technical aspect of it of that show? No, she just reads thing with me, and uh, she talks about the uh, books with me. I uh, all the editing and uh, uploading. What um what got you into podcasting? Well, I uh, I 
I was pretty shy about doing podcasts for a long time. I have a, a speech impediment, so that's always made me pretty uh, nervous about doing any uh, talking at all. But a uh, friend of the show, Michael David Wilson, harassed me into coming on his own podcast. And uh, I don't know, I had fun doing it. It's, I think. Uh oh. Max is frozen. Pardon, if you can hear me. I can, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you froze, Max. I gotcha. I think he's faking it. He's very good if he's faking it. <laughs> I have to keep looking down. I can't I can't look at that background. <laughs> <laughs> Is he there? <laughs> no, did, I he called just, him. did he just open your door? <laughs> there? Hey, our guest is uh temporarily unavailable. Our guest just kind of froze, and now he's not here. So, oh. well, you're being recorded, FYI. Probably cut this part. <laughs> uh, Max Booth joined. There oh, he is. Sorry. Hi. Hi. So after I went on Michael's podcast a few times, I went on it a few times, I kind of got addicted to uh, just the idea of sitting in front of a mic and telling jokes. I, uh, I like to... I like to be funny. I don't know. That seems pretentious. I just like to hang out and say stupid things that make only me laugh. And a podcast seems like the best I, best way to do that. And I was uh, getting invited to go on a bunch of podcasts, but not enough to uh, quench my <laughs> uh, my, podca- my podcast fools. So I thought, ah, let's just do this myself. And then, uh, yeah, I did one with uh, my wife, and that was fun. And uh, But it's a lot of, it takes a lot of, to do uh, Castle Rock Radio because we have to read books and make notes. So I decided, okay, let's. I'm going to do a second podcast where I have to, uh, no preparation, and and that is because I just you know I just get on, I get a guest, and I say, okay, guest, talk to me, and they talk, and then I react, and eventually it's done. So speaking of your pot ghoulish is uh you have said many times that Joe or as you like to call him uh Joey Splat. Joey Splat. Yeah. Oh he Joey... loved that. <laughs> he uh, did not. <laughs> <laughs> well he laughed at least. <laughs> we did that on Zoom and you should have seen his face. <laughs> I thought he was gonna karate chop me up through the microphone. So you stated many times that that's like that's your hero for in the literature world. How was it like talking to him? Was that your first really? time talking to him? No, I've met him many times. He goes to he also lives in Texas, and we usually go to the same conventions. And somehow we both like well, we usually both do like a book table at these conventions, and somehow we always get seated like super close to each other. So yeah. I've talked to him a bunch of times. Doesn't make it less uh, anxiety-inducing to speak to him, though. One funny thing, I think it's funny. Every time I see him, I ha- I feel the-, the need to like introduce myself to him because I'm convinced he has no idea who I am. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I am correct because he always acts like um, he's meeting me for the first time. <laughs> so I don't know. So yeah, Max, uh, I, uh... Go ahead, Max. I was going to say, uh, the, uh, the Billy Phil's the public reading I did was in Dallas. And it just so happened that Lansdale was also reading in da- at the same event. So, I mean, that was pretty insane to, uh, get up on stage and read something. And then we Lansdale. Did you go before him or after him? It, uh, he, he closed. <laughs> <the night. laughs> So um, I'm going to throw Patrick under the bus here because he is a Lansdale virgin. So I was hoping that you could suggest the best place to start for him. Yeah, I would suggest the best Joe Lansdale. It's a collection. That's what uh, introduced me to his book as well. It had, I mean, you can't go wrong with it. It's Bubba Hotep, the novella that was eventually made into a film by uh, Don Castorella. It has all of his best short stories, I think, in it, and it's a great introduction. And then 
if you wanted to do his novels, you could always go with Ivan, which is kind of a goofy book, pretty uh, nutty and cartoonish. If you wanted something a bit more uh, serious, I would go with Bottoms, which is kind of like To Kill a Mockingbird, but maybe a bit more uh, uh, grown-up feeling. <laughs> And I uh, would also recommend the uh, Happen Leonard books. Uh, I think the uh, initial book is Savage Season. Uh, yeah. And that's a great book. Yeah, and uh, also the TV show adaptation of Happen Leonard was awesome. And all of his adaptations were really good. Like, Cold Eye was a great movie. Also a great book. So, I mean, you can't really go wrong with him. Okay. I don't think I saw Cold in July, but did that have Michael C. Hall in it? It did, yeah. It was yeah. awesome. Uh, made by the same guy who adapted Happen Leonard. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I that was my first Lansdale book was Cold in July, and I just like the the way he writes dialogue in general, but especially in that book, just really, really pulled me in. Like, just nobody does it like that. I've seen Boba Hotep the movie, and that was funny as hell. I owned it on DVD. So, if the book's anything like it, uh, I'm gonna <laughs> probably love it. You would, man. You should definitely check it out. So as far as ghoulish goes, now you mentioned that you kind of like to hit a theme and try your best to stick with it, although that's, you know, not always successful. What kind of brought that idea about? Well, I uh, didn't want to do... I didn't want to copy, like, say, what Michael Wilson was doing. I didn't want to do a long film podcast like go through like the beginning and to like what's going on now like I mean, there's lots of podcasts like that and those are great but i don't have the stamina to do that like till 20 minutes of hosting a podcast i'm like okay i'm i'm out of questions what do you want to talk about <laughs> I, so i thought just picking one thing would make it kind of stand out and maybe would make it more exciting for uh, the guests as well because now they know okay i don't have to questions that maybe I, I've already answered a bunch of times. I usually let them pick, okay, what is something that makes you really excited about this genre? Let's talk about that only. And said we often stray from the theme quite a bit. How do you go about um, selecting guests to come on? Well, I have a, an assortment of friends who live in Austin who I enjoy really talking to so they come on quite a bit like a andrew hiltbolt is a frequent guest uh betty rocksteady she lives in canada but we talk a lot so it's, it's an easy dialogue we have with each other but also i i like to go like with mo- most podcasts do i uh, i see what books are coming out to get like little named awful because they will more like a yes to a podcast if they have to promote a new book anyway and i get a like like all we get a lot of advanced reading copies so you can kind of make a schedule based off of what's coming out in the year now let's take it back to your uh publishing company uh to your press um paul michael anderson actually is not michael david wilson in disguise (laughs) paul michael anderson standalone i haven't dove into that yet um I mean, Brennan, actually, we talk about it quite a bit. We're excited for it. Um, he's going to be in the show in September. But what is it that you would like to tell people that uh, may be interested, especially slasher fans? Because that's a very popular genre, I would think. Yeah. So it kind of has a unique approach to slashers, meaning the protagonist is the slasher. And it's not written in a way where the protagonist is unlikable. So I don't, to my knowledge, there's not many books or movies where the protagonist is someone whose job it is to kill innocent bystanders and also feel like emotional for that pr- protagonist. Like, there's no, ah, this guy's a scumbag. Paul sets it up in a way that is highly unique and something I had never read before. And like uh, Stephen Graham Jones, he uh, he was kind enough to do some advanced praise on the book, and he, even he said something like, wow, I've never seen a slash old book done this way, and he's the, he's the king of slashes. He also said something how, like, uh, next time I teach a, a slash old class, this book is definitely going to be on the list of 
recommended reading. So, I mean, that, oh, that's wow. pretty cool. So yeah. I mean, if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what what's going to. I don't know what else to say about that because you just said it. The, the King of Slashers uh, praised it and wants to teach about it. That's really cool. I didn't know that. Um, yeah. Now, is he someone that you might be working with ever? <laughs> <laughs> sorry Stephen you, Graham Jones. Yeah, sorry to put you on the spot, but I would love to, but no, probably not. I mean, he's he's finally gone beyond the the threshold, the fucking ditch of small press, and he's gone up into the big old presses. So I don't see him coming back down, especially with the success he's had with Mongrels and now the only good Indians. And yeah, we don't have the type of money to uh, publish a <laughs> Stephen Graham Jones book. <laughs> That one, that one looks like it's gonna do really well, and it's through Saga. Do Do you guys know what um, what that's an imprint from? I can't think of it off the top of my head. I have no idea. Okay, um, back to standalone. Um, now you're doing a thing where the I think it's the first 350 people who pre-order it also get serial yeah. killer trading cards. Tell us a little about about those. <laughs> okay, we can... yeah. <laughs> so. Uh... Uh, Paul had this idea to kind of mimic the old school um, uh, Marvel trading cards like they had the ones for X-Men and Spider-Man and all that I need maybe the 80s I don't know any case he came up with uh, six ideas for a slash little thing to kill like one is called the skill crow and uh, I don't have it in front of me so I'm blanking on the rest of the names but any any case uh, we went to uh, Luke Spoonel, who's a guy in the UK. Used him a bunch of times to do illustrations. I gave him descriptions that Paul came up with. He knocked it out like in a half a day. We filmatted them to uh, look like actual uh, trading cards. On the back of the cards, we even have like stats and stuff about that specific kill mm-hmm. tool. And yeah, we uh, we're printing them up on actual thick trading card. Uh, build and we will be sending a pack of all six of them with a every uh, pre-ordered copy and well, until we get to the uh, limit that is on the website including also a signed book plate by uh, Paul that's, that's awesome really cool. and uh Luke, Luke Spooner is um the artist who did the only the only cover I'm familiar with is he did Andy Cole's remains and that that is an awesome awesome cover. So I mean, that's my experience with his artwork. But um, I'd be really excited to see what those look like. So I, I should a, pre-order I, the book, and I should do you it should, quickly. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I have a funny uh, Luke Spoonel story I'll tell you guys. Uh, like I said, I've worked with him a long time. He usually does like the interior illustrations of some of the books we do. I did this book called uh, "Stealing Propeller Hats from the Dead" by David James Keaton the zombie collection and uh each uh each uh short still he had like an illustration to begin it with and uh one of the illustrations we wanted luke to draw a zombie shotgunning a bill so you know what that means right so i guess in the uk that phrase is not a thing so he sent us a photo of a zombie shooting a can with a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. I laughed so much. I'm laughing now. It's been like fucking five years. <laughs> so so you used that, right? You didn't have him redo it? <laughs> no, we had him do a new one. But I think we used we put that like at the end of the book as a bonus illustration. <laughs> Were you able to find it? Like, do they do that in the UK and have a different name for it? Or do they not drink like that? <laughs> he was just baffled when I told him what it meant. So I thought that doesn't exist. So he just, he hangs out with a different crowd. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the differences in our lingo from the people in the uh, in the UK, it's really interesting. Such as Fanny does not mean but over there. It means the French version. Yeah. And something else I discovered with them is that... Uh, you guys know the uh, the Wheels Waldo books in the yeah. UK. It's Wall is Wally. Why? <laughs> <laughs> it's so strange. Wally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's not like Waldo is a super popular name over here. So I don't, no, I don't I don't get that one. I don't uh, the one I saw anyone named that. The the one I saw thrown out today was um, uh, Jim McLeod of Ginger Nuts and Horror threw out. Uh, Bawbag, which I had never heard before, which is apparently the Scottish slang for scrotum. 
um, for anybody who's interested in working that into their vocabulary. Yeah, <laughs> that's usually what I call the uh, bag I keep balls in. No. <laughs> um, so as far as your release schedule goes, by the way, that was that that was it, the the spelling on that is B A W B A G. Ball bag would be oh. a, little too much, a little too on the nose, I think. Um, not not quite as, you know, I wouldn't feel as, oh, I never knew that, uh, if it was just ball bag. That's, you know, <laughs> I, more the yeah, first grade the slang language. than the Scottish slang. I thought um, you said ball bag, too, as in B-A-L-L, bag. I'll lean in, I'll lean in closer to the mic next time. Um, and also, it's the, I don't know if I can blame the uh, Massachusetts accent for that, but I'm going to anyway. Oh, you're um, from Massachusetts? Me too. I am. I am. <laughs> In case the Boston hat didn't give it away. Uh, oh. Yeah. For uh, audio listeners, Brendan is wearing a Boston hat. Um, Nailed so it. as far as your, <laughs> Good job, as bud. far as your release schedule, how, how do you guys determine um, about how many books you're going to put out in a year? And obviously this year is different, but on average. I don't think, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've been asked this question before, and I uh, never will know how to answer it, because uh, organization is not my strongest uh, attribute. I, uh, <laughs> a lot of it is a lot of frantic uh, emails, and I don't know. I, we don't have that thought, okay, how many should we put out this year? I guess once we get to like the three or maybe five, it's like ah, this is too much. Let's let's hold off now. But yeah, we don't have like a system in place where we go ah, we gotta we gotta get the quota. We just yeah, we don't have anything official. We are not extremely uh, professional. Yeah, we to try to time the releases around conventions that come out. So we had uh, Paul's book coming out. In August, actually, of this year, because it was going to time up with like three conventions that we were both going to go to, and that happening. So we pushed it back to uh, September. Reason I don't know if I can say, but uh, if you're a fan of certain surfaces that uh, sends out uh, boxes of collected books, uh that's the reason and i don't know what else i can say about that but you guys might know what i'm talking about yeah i think you'd be safe to say that but i i also wouldn't want you know anybody coming after me from that specific service so <laughs> i know i read between the lines and i figured that out so yeah, yeah i'm sure I mean, our listeners are very bright people so unrelated uh paul michael anderson does have Another book coming out in September through uh, Night Realms, so that's cool. Is that the one with Bracken McLeod? Yeah, I believe one of the other books will be included. I don't know. Who could say? Isn't it usually three or four? Uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> maybe right. one of those. Maybe one of those might be a novella by Paul. I don't know. Who Anything's knows? possible. Yeah. So, so he, Max, he has uh, worked with Nightworms in the past, so, and so have we. Yes. Yeah. Brenny, you got any more questions about his pu- publishing? <laughs> Actually, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wondering. Um, since Tales from the Crust, since the pizza anthology, yeah. Um, I'm not going to ask you if you've gotten, you know, pizza <laughs> stories after that closed. I'm sure you have, but. Has that changed the types of submissions that come into you? Like, do people just start just send you their weirdest shit now because they know you're into it? I don't think so. I do see folks like mentioning it, like in the email, and they submit it like as a joke. And I'm like, ah, this isn't a joke. I have PTSD. Don't joke around about this. <laughs> but yeah, but I haven't noticed any differences in the submissions. Once in a while, we do get a pizza themed one, but that's about it. The big, the biggest uh, like change that happened, I would say, is now if you go to any like open call and the guidelines, you see no pizza stories. So I, so you know, like all those rejections just fucking annihilated every other uh, open call submission. <laughs> did 
did you see the one that went up recently for a cake anthology and they specifically cited no reworked pizza stories? <laughs> yeah. No reworked pizza stories. My uh, my pal uh, Ben's doing that. He has a great YouTube channel. You guys should check it out. I don't know the name of it, so look for Ben on YouTube. <laughs> Plug it. <laughs> yeah, he reviews books. He did he reviewed the pizza book and somehow in the uh, editing soft bill, he turned himself into a pizza as the review went on. It was fucking strange. <laughs> How many weird. slices did he give it? I don't Five know. Slices? I Four hope slices? So. <laughs> as, let's be honest, it's like a two sliced. <laughs> so uh, you talked a little bit about your World War II story. That interests me a lot. I like history. Um, yeah. I'm wondering. That doesn't. It didn't sound like it's a horror, but uh, is there anything you can tell us about it? No. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, it's something I'm still writing. I actually just kind of put a pause on it because it's, it's exhausting. Because every time I need to write anything into it, I have to go and do some research. And I'm not someone who does a lot of research. So the past, since the beginning of the year I've been milking on it, I'm only like 20,000 milks into it. And it keeps changing every time I go back to it. But uh, this week, actually, I decided to, to take a hiatus because I know I'm not going to finish that book for at least another year and a half, probably, just because of how big and epic it is in scope. So yeah, I took a break. And now I began something else I'm hoping to finish within the next uh, few months, hopefully. And uh, do I don't know what I can say about that one because I kind of want to keep that one a secret. Sure. I won't say anything. This is not being recorded either. So <laughs> is there... What's your... What? I know you said it's frantic. I know that you have worked on two books at once. Do you typically do one book at a time or do you throw in short stories... For, and, and the reason, the specific reason why I asked is because I heard Josh Malaman say something interesting that I never thought of before on a show last week where he said he writes um, short stories in between novels. Now, I don't know if he always does that, but he said he has. Uh, I'm just, it got me thinking, like, it's a time when you're, t you normally would take away from not looking at your novel. You know, you give yourself a little time to look at it with new eyes. So you want to write something that's not too long. Um, do you do anything like that? I I haven't written a, a short story in a few years, actually. So not with that. But I do a lot of nonfiction stuff. So, yeah, kind of. I, I, that would be considered a, a brief break from, like, novel writing. I do – I write, like, uh, nonfiction for places like uh, Crime Reads and uh, Lit React also. That's a nice little uh, interlude of uh, a, a way that I can write something without having to make stuff up. I can just go, okay, these are the facts. How do I write it in an entertaining way? How'd you get hooked up with Lit Reactor? Because you pretty much seem to cover every writing aspect that someone could pursue. Yeah, Lit Reactor. Uh, I've been with them, I think, for about six years now. And they basically they uh, posted a, "Hey, we need new contributors, so uh, send a pitch as a like application." And I did, and they accepted it. And yeah, that's how I got hooked up with them. It was a uh, shockingly easy. Okay. And uh, I got one more question about a future book. I got permission from Michael to ask. Michael, David, I mean, uh, Melvin Douglas Wallaby said, <laughs> said yeah. that uh, I could ask you about the book you're working on with him about fucks, ducks, I meant. Ducks, you're working on duck books. It's Sorry, called that, a it's that okay. was a typo. That was a typo, <laughs> my bad. It's called Wounded Duck. And it's a uh, an idea that we came up with after he was texting me one night because I, I do a night shift at a hotel, and he lives in Japan. So when I'm at th my job, he's kind of like doing his day to day stuff, and he uh, he was texting me because he has this uh, this neighbor who's always like jump roping at odd times, and he's always cr like sobbing as he jump ropes, and he listens <laughs> to like odd music. And we just kind of began like joking around with different possibilities of what could be going on with him. And one of the ideas we came up with ended up being like, ah, that'd be a good book. So, yeah, that's what we're doing. And I don't want to say anything else about the plot of that because it would uh, ruin the magic. 
Now, is this like in Japan or was this when he was in uh, in England? Japan, yeah. So the the jump roping enthusiast is uh, still at law. Uh, uh, he's still loose. Yeah. Oh huh, yeah. Well, I I would be interested to know more as far as that goes. Um, actually, I lied. I got one more question about a future book that you probably can't say anything about. Um, creature feature. You are going to be one of the people that are part of the. Uh, let's just call it the Keelan. Patrick slash uh, oh, Alan Baxter yeah. book series. Yeah, I had no idea what you were talking about, Phil, in a second. I was like, what book? <laughs> so <laughs> this is a little exclusive to Dead Headspace. Me and Max are writing a creature feature together. We don't know what it's about. <laughs> uh, seriously, what what is your creature feature about? And in, is that the right title, uh, subgenre? I guess. I yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> I don't know. I kind of half-assed uh, said I would do one on Twiddle, and now it's the question everybody wants to know. I don't know how i got involved <laughs> it was a joke when i said i would do it and then uh keelan uh, made a front cover fill it and now people are expecting me to do this i have began something it's going to be about an armadillo and i'm like <laughs> 1200 builds into it <laughs> eventually i'm going to get to it but the whole idea with these books i guess is all the uh, proceeds will be going to a charity and a. Uh, I guess I'm focusing more on things that might help me uh, quit my day job. So it doesn't have the highest of priorities at the moment. No, I, I got you. Well, yeah, I guess if it wasn't for the pandemic, you would be closer to that goal, it sounded like, as far as a, a movie adaptation to one of your books. And, I mean, I don't know about you, but you got a few bucket list uh, publishers that I'd like to check off, such as... Well, Fangoria wasn't one, but that's pretty awesome. I didn't know that they published books until yours came out. And then um, uh, Cemetery Dance. Uh, it, are you are you friends with Rich Schismar? I I seem to be now. I wasn't at the time. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I'll text him things and he doesn't respond, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard you say that uh, he... When you guys talked about Touch Tonight, he referred to you as someone, uh, as Rich uh, Layman, Richard Layman, uh, similar to his. Yeah. Yeah, Dick, Dick Lay. <laughs> Is that a new name? Dick Lay? That's his name, Dick Lay. Lay. I'm glad it's that way. If you reverse the name, it's kind of uh, a little weird, don't you think? It's kind of a command. Lay Dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he said uh, he reminded me of uh, Dick Lehman, and I said, ah, thanks, but I've, I've never read him, so I don't know if that's a compliment or not. I know he <laughs> writes the word, r- <laughs> no, he writes the word rump a lot in his books. Nice. I like a good rump. What about you fellas? Uh, yeah, no, I, I like a good rumping. <laughs> <laughs> I think those are different things. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck it means. <laughs> so, running. This is a, this is a... <laughs> <laughs> some mashed good, potatoes with uh, some rumping. Uh, this is a good segue to talk about what I'm sure you'd like to talk about now. Oh, what is that? Touch the night, motherfucker. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so we we glossed a little bit, but um, how did you get hooked up with Cemetery Dance for uh, Touch the Night? And is that did they come looking for you? Or oh, god, he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> For those just listening to the show, Max has a background of a very close close up of his face. He disappeared into his uh, nostril, and he was showing us Touch the Night, the hardcover edition, which is beautiful, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. I knew. <laughs> what was the question? I was completely distracted by my goofs. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's it almost wiped it from my mind. Um, <laughs> the question, I think, was uh, how did you get hooked up with Cemetery Dance to do that? Yeah, so I uh, emailed him. I said, hey, I am having a difficult time giving an agent. And uh, I want to send you this book, can I? And he said, yeah. So I sent it to him along with a synopsis of the whole plot. And some time passed, and uh, he emailed me and said, hey, this is good. I want to publish it. And I said, okay. <laughs> then the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah, I'll have, like, an exciting story. No, I hate to be like, rude. That's not a very book. exciting said, story. Yeah. Could you could you jazz it up a little bit? Maybe add, like, a chase scene? <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I Michael just Bay. seen a... 
I had just seen the the new uh, Toy Story movie, and I came out of the theater, and I looked at my phone, and I said, "Hey, Max, this was good. I want to publish this." And I said, "Yeah." And uh, the family, my family, was like, "Yeah, that's cool. Let's leave this movie theater now." And I said, "Okay." <laughs> and then we left. So we drove at the limit of the speed limit signs on the road. We did not break the law. Very good. Very good. I like it. Yeah. So Thank they you. they published the hardcover and the uh, the ebook. ebook. Yeah. Um, and then Perpetual Motion Machine took over the paperback. That's correct. Yeah. He uh, despite liking the book, he didn't want to do the paperback. So I guess he didn't like it as much as he claimed. So I was left to do the paperback myself, and that's what I did. And uh, yeah, I think it, I kind of like doing that myself. I mean, I also self released the. Uh, a new novella coming to do something, and uh, that was cool. I like having all the control. I've uh, I've had books come out with presses in the past, and uh, it's led to difficulties and frustrations. So I kind of skipped that by just doing it myself. That's fair. So uh, for we need to do something now. You've probably been on like you know thirty eight podcasts by now to tell the synopsis of that. But can I ask you to do the shorthand version one more time? Yeah, uh, it's about a family stuck in the bathroom doing a tornado warning. All right, so and they get the... trapped in it. So yeah, I mean, during the, the the storm that happens, a tree falls down. It crashes through the house. It lands on the opposite side of the bathroom door. And they can't get out. And what happens? Uh, we follow the next week, week and a half, two weeks. Two weeks and a half? Who knows? Who could say? Yeah. Time well, means nothing. Well, at least they have a toilet in there. They do have a toilet. They have a sink. They have a can. They have a bathtub. They it's have also a... relatable with the whole toilet paper thing. You think so? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> I uh, I don't I don't talk about the, to- the TP situation in the book, but... Uh, yeah, I, I assume they had plenty in stock. It would have been a, a, a fucking awful situation if not. Unless they have a bidet. I don't know. I don't remember the bidet. But what's nice about you know the whole story featuring in one bathroom is that all of those features you just mentioned, the toilet, the sink, the tub, those are all major players in the setting. They all come into you know play at some point in the book. <laughs> the toilet's the protagonist. It actually <laughs> narrates the book. <laughs> I, I will tell you that my personal bathroom door opens in, but I do believe in the existence of bathroom doors that where the door opens out. So I, I'm not going to pick on have, you for that. If I didn't have my face as a background, I could get up and show you the bathroom. It's right behind me, the one I based it on. <laughs> but, uh, can we get an autograph from the protagonist? Yeah. I mean, probably. I don't. I'm this is probably some stuff I can collect from the bottom of it and send you. I'll I can, send you I can... next address after we're done here. <laughs> I mean, I work at a shit. I work at a shit plant, so uh, I'll bring it to work. <laughs> you work at a shit plant? A plant that what produces feces? What are you talking about? Uh, it's a wastewater treatment plant, meaning that we clean all the county's poop and pee and whatever anyone else flushes down the toilet. Nice. I'm uh, stripping for you guys because it is hot in this room. How hot is it? Uh, hot, man. I don't have any fans on because I'm doing a podcast, so it feels like a sauna now. Well, I appreciate you suffering for us. Uh, it's <laughs> probably probably for the best. I mean... Yeah. Leads to a funnier Max, right? It's pretty I, I, I gotta be honest. I'm a, I'm a little surprised you had no follow-up questions for Patrick when he said uh, option number three. You know, one was, was pee, there was poop, and there was anything else that goes down the toilet. I'm very curious about what the most interesting anything else you've ever come across is. Me? No, no, well, Patrick, you, Max, yeah. you don't work at a shit plant, so... Yeah, I was <laughs> the toilets. Gonna be Talk honest, about... man, it's uh, not exciting. I've seen a lot of uh, lady products, uh, a lot of plastic bags, a lot of uh, those uh, 
I'm doing air quotes. Disposable wipes that do damage to systems. Uh, it's a pretty shitty job. <laughs> You're right. That's not interesting. What a terrible how, question. How often do you say it's a shit job? Uh, probably more than I'd like to admit to. <laughs> <laughs> I would also say that. It's okay. So I actually have a question that I've asked two people now, and I didn't even think I'd ask one person, but um, first I asked Ken McKinley about trilogies, then I talked to Mercedes Yardley about it. So I was curious if you would be interested in giving us your input. What is your take as a both an author and a publisher with, let's just say it's someone that either doesn't have a name, hasn't published yet, or maybe has not the best track record with publications what do you say to people that want to pursue either a trilogy or a series is that a good idea is that something that they should go for i don't know i mean it seems like with any experience i've had with it and also from listening to rebels that it's always it always leads to like bad feelings about it because you Almost always, the second book and the follow-ups, they don't sell as much as the original one does. Mm -hmm. And you also seem to come into a lot of frustration if you finish book one out, and then you like you get this pressure to get the rest of them done. So I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing. I don't think I have an opinion about if you should or shouldn't do it. But I would recommend if you do want to do it, maybe have all the books already done. That's my uh, best uh, advice, is to wait to release them until you have all the books done. Unless yeah. it's like... Unless it's like one of those crime series where you just have like the same protagonist and they go around doing like a different case. That's different, but like... If you have a connected trilogy, it would be nice if you had the trilogy all the way done. Because, I mean, I don't know about you guys. I mean, like, when I finish a book, I have to go back to the beginning many times and add new things and take things out, right? And it seems to me, I've never written, like, a sequel. I haven't done a trilogy. But it seems to me it would be a pain in the ass if I'm doing book three and I think, ah, if only I had this idea in book all of this would really connect and you would be able to do that if you hadn't already released book one. So to make everything smooth and connect and all the right film shadowing, it seems like you should wait to do anything until you have the complete story told the way you want it told. That, yeah, I've heard that before. That's, that's solid advice. Okay. Um, and we talked about conventions earlier. I wanted to ask, Scares of Care, you mentioned, we actually talked about it probably, I don't know when. It seems like last year. Could have been months ago. Uh, Scares of Care was one of the conventions that you were going to go to. Yeah. Have yeah. you gone to that before? No, this was going to be my first time going. I was uh, thrilled to do it because I was going to meet... Uh, Paul and Michael Anderson for the first time too. I've known him since I began publishing. He uh, he accepted my novel when he was editing for a like, different press. I mean, I've known him a long time, but we've never met. And yeah, I was so excited, but now it's not happening. I was gonna go to that too for the first time. That would have been fun. Uh, yeah, maybe next year. Um, Paul and Michael Anderson edited your first book. Was it? Yeah. Did you say yeah. What? what, what oh. What uh, press was that with? Uh, uh, a company called Post Milden Press. It is no longer in existence. So it, uh, the, the novel was called uh, Toxicity. It, it it wasn't Paul's press. He just he had a job that uh, he did some freelance editing, and he was one of the guys who did like the acquisition editing and like the uh, copy editing and. Yeah, he read my book in the slush pile and recommended the uh, press accept it, and they did. How did that feel? Awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, debut novel, it was accepted. I was like fucking 20, maybe? Yeah, I didn't think that would ever happen, and then it did. Aren't you I thought, yeah, this is this is cool. You're only, what, 28 now? 27. 
Yeah. I think it's fair to say you're the youngest one we've talked to so far. You, that's crazy because you've done so much. <laughs> you, I mean, you've gotten published by some reputable names. You got your own publishing company. You own a magazine with your wife. Uh, people, everyone seems to know you. So that's scary. Yeah, it's frightening. Uh, I don't know. I was uh, I was doing a, a text interview today, and I had to go look up something in my old emails, and I saw the uh, the Billy Philst uh, short story I sold. Well, I say sold in in quotes. It was accepted in English, but I wasn't paid anything. It was uh, in July of 2011, which was uh, the month I turned 18. So yeah, I guess I've been doing being published at least since 2011. I saw that. That was a very uh... Let's say unique situation. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, like I like to say, I am a magnet for madness, and the lunatics uh, often seem to cross my path. So speaking of that, um, is there ever a situation as a publisher where you come across... I'm not looking for specifics, of course. Yeah. But anything where you, you just... <laughs> either laugh and shake your head or you look, you tell Lori, like, what the fuck are we supposed to do with this? <laughs> Is there any advice that you would tell authors that are just looking to be published with you guys or anyone else? So I've definitely had those uh, things happen with us. And, uh, yeah, I'm not into specifics just because I feel like it's a different... Uh, what, do you, what do you say? It's different when, like, you are the one being published by the the psychopath because I don't, I don't know like different dynamic when i am the one publishing them i like i wouldn't shit talk them or anything like that so i'm not gonna no but, yeah, uh, recommendations or advice for like how to get published with us I, I don't know just just don't be a dickhead uh be good at writing be be good at writing in a like right now i mean we do have an open call Full submissions, but only till the full sense of color at the moment, just because we kind of realize, oh fuck, we've uh, mostly only published uh, the whites. We should change that. So that's what we're trying to do. But besides that, we don't really as uh, do open calls that much anymore, just because it's a pain in the ass. Usually, I mean, I'm friends with a lot of folks in the genre, and I pay attention to what they have been uh, working on. And if I see if I uh, know someone I like a lot, I know they could do good writing. I know they actually do stuff on social media, so it's not just going to be me promoting them only. I'll reach out and be like, "Hey, hit me up when you want to have presses consider what you wrote." That's pretty cool, man. Um, what well, was sorry? I have a brain fart. Well, that's okay. Real quick, um, I, I wanted to jump in um, about you guys having open submissions uh, to people of color only. I, I thought that was a really cool move, and we've had a couple conversations with um, people on, on different episodes where they, they basically say that um, the reason they might not... Trying to think how to phrase this. So basically, they are more likely to... Uh, submit their story to a publisher they see with a more diverse lineup. And even though you may have a publisher like uh, like you guys, let's say six months ago, that is absolutely not you know opposed and is definitely willing to take those submissions because they look at a lineup that is typically all white, they might feel unwelcome and not as willing to um to submit there so the you know owners the publishers coming forward and saying we want your stories and we're going to make this drastic move to show to show you that we really mean it um is just it, is it's huge and I'm, I'm sure you've heard that more than once or twice in the last couple months i was trying to unmute my mic and it wasn't unmuting but yes thank you i uh I appreciate that a lot, and we're trying to improve. I mean, I think if you are not trying to improve, then you either remain stuck or you decline into uh, something else. So I, we would like to improve. I have filled a few uh, praises because of the open call. Definitely have gotten some criticism besides that. 
So, yeah, I mean, a few folks will uh, not too happy with that. And, uh, eh, fucking can't please everybody. Yeah, you know, for just, you know, from knowing your online persona, that's the exact reaction I would expect if I were not too pleased with that. I would expect Math- Max Booth to say, fuck you to me. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure those people are not disappointed. My favorite, uh, my favorite thing to say online when someone is being stupid, especially on Twitter, like if this is almost on topic, but not quite, like usually like if you post, like if I post something about something I like, or if I post like an article to or something I wrote, and if you always get someone who will comment, like trying to disagree with you, or like basically weigh in with the old opinion when nobody asked, my favorite response is to type, oh, okay, it gets them every time. I don't know why. <laughs> but sometimes they apologize. I don't know why, but oh, okay, <laughs> it gets them. It has to be just okay. It can't be okay, A, Y. It has to be okay. Something about that type of magic in the spelling knocks them down every time. It's nice <laughs> that you figured out a strategy. It's almost like yeah. you're saying there's a lot of assholes out there. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> a storm of anuses, I would say, yeah. <laughs> a storm of anuses. I like it. So Once Max, again, you... if, we, if we titled the, the uh, episodes, I think that would be our title. But we storm don't, asses, so it's not. Yeah. It no, wouldn't be a ch- children of child game bangs. No, no, no. We left that in the past. We're uh, we're, we're pretending that one didn't happen. I'm oh, pretty I, sure. Uh... I'm pretty sure that wouldn't be allowed on Lipson. <laughs> <laughs> you do a lot of things on Lipson. Right. I'm new to it, so maybe. I mean, I'm not gonna try that one though. Um, okay. Max, so <laughs> just moving fast. Go. Yeah. But greatest uh, idea you have, you could do, man. Just ignore me when I talk about that stuff, and keep going. So I got a kick, have... Patrick. I'm sorry. I know you're changing the subject. I got a kick. You were on a, a podcast. Uh, I uh, I don't actually know when you were on it. I listened to it a couple weeks ago, and mm. it was um, a little less, let's say, silly than than Inkheist, for example. Yeah. Um, and I remember you made a joke about edging. And they just totally like it, it. Like it never happened, and and you just you let it you let it go. You're like, okay, it's this kind of show. <laughs> what does that say about me? That I'm trying to think. Okay, what podcast did I talk about edging? And like eight of them pop up. <laughs> it could be any of them. I think it was the uh, edging podcast. I wish that was one. Exactly. I would. Uh... So can I read the thing that you posted recently? Because I think it's pretty funny. Uh, it has to do with your zombie story submission, just so yes. there's context. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> so this is a uh, – <laughs> this is this is what the show is now, I guess. Fuck it. Um, so Max got an email that he posted on Twitter. I think it's pretty funny, but I just want to hear what you have to say about it. So for the listeners that uh, know what the fuck I'm talking about, this is what it said. Subject, zombie story submission. In the body, it says, hi, Max. Okay, here's the deal. As far as your writing style, I was fine with it. The only thing is that, to me, your story is more like a document by a scientist than a story, but it isn't that bad that I would reject it outright. I like it, but not enough to want to give you a book for it. In other words, I don't want to pay you for it, as I don't love it. But... Many writers could care less about the book and just want to be accepted and published. If that's you, then let me know and I will still use your story, put it in the antho, send you the contract. If you say, hell no, I want compensation, that's fine, but then I have to reject this particular story. And how you want to send more standard stuff with people talking and fighting, etc. or anything in between. I'm fine with whatever you want to do. And thanks again for sending it so quickly. If the answer is yes, you want in. I attached cover art for the antho. Your story would be in. Cheers. And just for uh, the record, there is lots of misspellings. I probably tripped over them. Um, he doesn't like capitalization. Punctuation is really, uh, you know, in the air. So for someone that is editing a potential book, as he puts it, and not a anthology. I don't know. It just sounded weird because he's talking about an anthology. It is a book, but whatever. Um, It was weird that an editor would uh, have a lot of typos to someone that he's kind of (laughs) rejecting. So, do you have any comments to that (laughs) that post? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, 
stressful reference to the uh, audience and, and also watching. I haven't forgotten about you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this was the uh, the story I mentioned previously in the episode about my uh, first acceptance. It was July 2011. I had never uh, gotten anything published. Uh, this was a brand new thing for me. And I uh, did not realize <laughs> how fucking incredible of a response that was. So, like, going into it blind, I was like, ah, I don't need any money. Why would I need money? Why would anyone pay me the right? I just want to get published, which is the uh, mindset a lot of folks have when they feel get into this. And it's a... Uh, it's a mistake to think that way, but it's also understandable because we we just will so desperately get published that we will do anything. That man's name, uh, he is commonly known known as Tony G. He had many uh, micro presses when I first began writing and publishing. He's kind of vanished now. Uh, some of the companies. Living Dead Press, one was called Open Casket Press. Uh, at one point, he had one called STFU Publishing, which is Shut the Fuck Up Publishing. He is a maniac. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he is a lunatic. He is a psycho. Uh, the second submission I ever sent him, because I sent him a new one for some <laughs> reason, <laughs> I was living alone. I was 18. I uh, had a cell phone for the first time in my life, and I was uh, you, you give your cell phone number out on a couple of levels when you submit something, and it was 10, 11 p.m. He, uh, I got a phone call. It was him, and it sounded like he was coked up out of his mind. He did not between sentences. He, uh, he snorted a lot. He, uh, he, his voice got really high as he got excited. And he was telling me how he, uh, the whole publishing uh, industry was out to get him. Also uh, made it really clear that he had read my submission, but he would never publish a story told from the uh, Phyllis Pilsen, and that no respectable uh, company would ever publish that type of fiction. I would have to rewrite it to be in Phil Pilsen. And I said, no, that's okay. I'm not going to do that because like, I had point i realized i have i had made a big mistake i will uh <laughs> dealing with this lunatic and he talked to me for like an hour maybe even two i don't know at this point this was 2012 <laughs> well 2011 yeah so he's uh, he's pretty insane uh, if you uh you can find out some real stuff about him if you do some googling uh it's also a pretty big controversy around time because he also published a uh, a short story from someone named Mandy DeGate D-E-G-E-I-T DeGate? I don't know. Anyway the controversy was he had made all uh, these edits to Julie and she uh, he never sent it back so Mandy could uh, see what he wrote or edited. He oh. added like rape scenes to the story and just oh, published it that way with Mandy's name on it. And it was shit blew up after that. He kind of went into the fucking ditch you crawled out of. I guess that's yeah. wild. Any questions? What the fuck? Yeah. I don't know how to follow up <laughs> with that, man. <laughs> there you go. There's the, it's the rambling Max I've been waiting for all my life. <laughs> I don't know what to follow up with that, Brennan. Seriously. <laughs> I had something, but I, the story sucked me in. Max, before we uh, head towards the finish line, I had one more thing I wanted to ask you about. Uh, we need to do something, but really it's applicable to a lot of your writing. Yeah. Um, so with that and with uh, carnivorous lunar activities, you kind of based both of those in a just really small, enclosed, just one location. What what is it about that tact that kind of appeals to you? I enjoy having limitations to play around with. And I think if I limit myself one setting, a few settings, just a limited amount of settings, and I, I know I can't expand the vast cast, a vast cast, that's a... I'm, I'm coining that to him. So I, I don't like having a vast cast. Uh, I'm sick of it. Someone else can use it. Uh, a big cast. <laughs> Stephen King. Fuck. I lost already what I was saying. Anyway, I just like the ha I like having limitations. I think having a limited cast, a limited setting, I should say, adds a nice uh, touch of claustrophobia. 
I enjoy uh I wrote we need to do something specifically because a friend of mine set me up with a uh uh indie Canadian film company. So I wrote it as a script to begin with. And I wrote it with a limited budget line, and I, that didn't happen. So I uh, decided to uh, rewrite it as a novella. I, it's just a lot of fun. I don't know. I enjoy challenging myself. Like a lot of times when you uh, you talk to writers, sometimes you'll hear them say, "Ah, oh, I love a uh, kind of putting them in the cool of a room and seeing how they might be able to get out of it." But I kind of do that in the, like, the most physical sense. I put them in a room and see what they can do. <laughs> Maybe I get kind of a issue like with this uh, Los Alamos book is, I'm, I'm doing now. Is I have all of like, New Mexico to play with. And that's kind of uh, uh, terrifying to me. I enjoy having something much more minimal. Much more uh, smaller than fucking state to play around with like the book i'm writing right not this instant but i was looking at it today it takes place mostly in the house a little bit in the back and that's about it i don't know i i think my greatest strength with uh, writing at least the dialogue I, I i love writing dialogue it's my favorite thing to do and i i think i am pretty good at it. and you can really use that in a, in a book or movie, screenplay, anything, when you just have a limited setting and you just have these kill tools bouncing off of each other, I think that's a lot of fun. Yeah, and I, and I would say that, you know, um, with, with a book like We Need to Do Something, y- you can't pull that book off if you're not pretty good at dialogue. So, yes, I agree. You are good at dialogue. Thank you. Um, did, yeah, of course. Did you get into either one of those, that or Lunar Activities, get partway through it and say, shit, this was a bad idea. I want to leave the bathroom. (laughs) Honestly, no. I don't know. I think I'm just really comfortable in that one setting. I, those, those, uh, till the end of uh, Carnivalous Activities, they they do leave the basement. And that was probably the most stressful I was during the writing of the of the book because I thought, ah, anything can happen now. They could go any direction. It just it seems safer in my mindset to keep them strapped in one place. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, That's actually some good tips in there. Uh, Isolation definitely works in horror. Um, Yeah. And it can help you become a better writer. I like dialogue too. It's definitely a, a lot. It moves stories around uh, along a, a lot better than uh, you know narrative. Um, it just sucks you in more. So it's definitely something to focus on. Can't tell if Max froze again. I think he did. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, readers, book reviewers, pot... (laughs) Hey, hey. Hey. My fucking netbook is sucking tonight, guys. I apologize. It's okay. Uh, Please stay again for, uh... I keep wanting to say Michael David Wilson, Paul... Michael Anderson. Yeah, uh, mid-September. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Make sure to check that out. Pre-order it. You can get your awesome sports cards, except it's slashers. So that will be fun to play with whoever wants to collect slasher cards or collect them all like Pokemon. That's still a thing, I think. I don't know. Um, We sometimes like to ask our guests what they're reading. Any book recommendations as well? So what, what are you reading? Okay. Trying to think. I just finished the, uh, I uh, just finished the uh, the new flesh, which was a, a tribute anthology to David Cronenberg. That's pretty fun. I just finished the uh, Tremblay's new book. I just finished the uh, Stephen Graham Jones's. Uh, I finished that a while ago. What the fuck am I talking about? I just began uh, Adam C. Zolli's, uh Clown in the Cornfield, and it's it's a lot of fun. I would recommend that. Yeah, I've heard good things about that. He's nice. a good dude. I like I like his books. I've been following him since uh, he began publishing. He's great. Hmm. How about you, uh, Brennan? Uh, I got a couple things going. Real quick, um, I just finished Survivor Song. Max, how'd you like that one? 
I liked it a lot. It also, uh, I like that it uh, reminded me of a of a book I enjoyed even more by Tremblay, but I won't say anything else. <laughs> I I realized as I began making that comment that I could be spoiling the book, so I I locked myself into a trap. Yeah, I like. I don't know. <laughs> it, it's, okay, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it. We'll leave the trap there. You know, we can eat. We could probably even edit it to make it sound a little more like planned out. But uh, no. Um, so I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading White Pines by uh, Gemma Amor. Um, I'm reading All That's Fair by S. H. Cooper. Uh, her collection of stories comes out in I think September, maybe. How about you, Patty? Gravity, uh, gravity, Slaves to Gravity, that is by Summer Cannon and Wesley Southern, that is slated for, I think, August, early August. Brian Keene's Ghoul for the first time, um, also reading Grindhouse Press's first anthology, Worst Laid Plans, it's pretty good. Um, Brennan, why don't you take away, my man? Sure. So uh, I just, I, really quickly, I want to remind readers, book reviewers, podcasters, librarians, booksellers, and lovers of great scary books that Buzz Book Expo 2020, it's just around the corner. Buzz Book Expo is a live streaming event in which publishers will be announcing all the great new horror fiction releases they have to offer through the coming year. There's going to be interviews, Q&As, presentations, book cover reveals, and more from all your favorite horror publishers, and it's all for free. You can spend two days immersed in exciting book talk from publishers and authors alike. The event takes place on August 22nd through 23rd, and all information, including links to the expo, can be found at marysangi, that's S-A-N-G-I, dot wordpress.com slash buzz dash book dash expo dash 2020. We hope to see you there. Thank you, sir. Max, thank you for your time. We really appreciate this. Everybody check out the books that we talked about. Max is uh, Touch Tonight through Cemetery Dance. Look yeah. for Standalone through Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. And uh, anything else you want to recommend? Uh, what's that my desk? Uh, yeah, The Mud Ballad by uh, fuck. Joe Quinnell. It's not showing up. Yeah, The Mud Ballad. I'm reading oh. this as well. It's pretty What's that good. About? It's about, uh, uh, oh yeah, it's about Siamese twins. It took me a moment. Yeah, it's about twins. Uh, this is what she wrote in the. Uh, she uh, signed it for me. She wrote, uh, "Max, sew this book to your fucking head and never be alone again." So that's cool. Is that a threat Can't help but notice dream? that it's it's not sewed to your head though. Um, well, I, I'm 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 waiting. Now I'm going to vanish. <laughs> Max, where can I, people follow you? Uh, real quick, I want to... Can I tell you guys a story about that photo behind me? Go ahead. It just uh, popped up. Uh, when I was still on Facebook a few years ago, I I, I had this fun... Is, I say funny idea, funny to me, that I would make a uh, Facebook photo... Uh, what do you call those? Uh, those collections? So I made one, and I, I called it... Hello, Google. How do I take my photo? <laughs> and I uploaded the image you see behind me 150 times. And I pissed off so many people by just flooding the old fucking newsfeed with my face. <laughs> and again, it's a very, very close up of his face. <laughs> eyes wide. Thick black glasses. He's touching his areola, I think. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> His oh. shirt is coming off for anyone that is listening. Oh, no. <laughs> That's fucking creepy. Yeah, no, okay. <laughs> My website is uh, Tales from the Booth. You can uh, find all the things you need to find on that website, including my Patreon, which is uh, patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. And Twitter, where you can find them as uh, Give Me Your Teeth. <laughs> yeah. Where'd that, where'd that come from? I uh, I used to be a big fan of Cracked.com back before he went to shit. And there was a uh, columnist who would write for it called Sean Baby. And he would create these really funny Photoshopped uh, articles of comic old school comic books. He also did this great article about the uh, the mascot from Bill Gold King. 
<laughs> he had this image of the mascot above a man sleeping. And the caption was, give me your teeth. And it made me laugh so much. And I still laugh about it now. And it's been like a decade. And yeah, I just thought, ah, I'll just do that. I'll never be able to look at Burger King again the same <laughs> way. <Or> sleep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Max Booth the Third, thank you, sir. Brennan, thank you for joining again. And everyone who listened, thank you. And please look out for Mary San Giovanni's. Hope I didn't fuck that last name up, guys. Did I fuck that last name up? Yeah. Probably. I've heard it pronounced two different ways by myself mm. tonight. So I don't know which one's right. Um, please look out for the Buzz Book Expo 2020, August 22nd and 23rd. All free, online, good stuff. There's publishers from all over the world. Authors all over the world. Q&A. You can talk to probably Max at some point. I don't know. Not, not even at the expo. I'm not sure. I might be. I, uh, she said she was adding me to a list, but I don't know if that's what it was about. Or maybe some different lists. <laughs> so I might be involved. You could talk to Max at the expo. <laughs> he might be on a uh, kill list. We're not sure yet. <laughs> so again, thank you, sirs. Thank you, listeners. Everybody have a good night or good afternoon, wherever you're from. Have a good one.